All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the much anticipated 40th week, finally, of our chronological Bible reading plan as we endeavor to read through the Bible in a year, more or less in a chronological fashion. We are 40 weeks in, which is significant. Why? Because we have finally come to the New Testament scriptures, uh, the first century scriptures, as we head into the Gospels this week with the Gospel of Matthew. So I'll have a bit to say about Matthew's Gospel in a minute. But before I do, I want to encourage you to watch a bonus video tutorial that I did this week. It's here on our playlist in YouTube uh, on the intertestamental period, all right? Between Malachi or Nehemiah and the onset of the Gospels, there is a 400-year gap in our Bible. Well, a lot of things took place in that 400 years, and it's important to have an appreciation of that so you can understand the world in which Jesus was born. All right, so before you watch this video or launch into Matthew this week, make sure you watch that video on the time between the Testaments. I hope that it helps for, that it helps you. Okay, here we go. We're going to be reading Matthew's Gospel this week. I want to share with you three things that really stood out to me as I read through it again this week. But before we do that, just a little bit of general information to get you in the zone. Matthew's Gospel, some believe, is the oldest of the four Gospels, or at least portions of it are old, and we're around in the early days of the church. So there's a bit of a disagreement about that. Some people think Mark is older, but whatever, it doesn't really matter. I personally believe that much of Matthew was around in the very, very early days of the New Testament, for reasons I won't go into now. But anyway, what we do know is it is the longest of the four Gospels. So you're going to be reading 28 chapters this week. Don't worry, Mark's next week, and it's a much shorter, more concise book, so you have a bit of an easy week next week. Uh, now, for me, I read Matthew this week in three sittings, uh, although if you want to read a part every day this week, I've also, in the notes underneath, uh, divided up the chapters into seven portions. So if you want to read it in seven parts or read it in three, entirely up to you, look at the notes below, and I hope that helps you if you want to do that. What we do know about Matthew's Gospel as well is that it is probably targeted at a Hebrew or a Jewish audience. And we know this because there are so many references to the Old Testament in it, and either direct references or allusions to the Old Testament narrative. And that's why it's really cool for you and me that it's the first gospel we're reading because we've just had 39 weeks of nothing but Old Testament. And with all that information fresh in your mind and nuance and language fresh in your mind, I think you're really going to appreciate Matthew's gospel in a whole new way uh, because it was largely targeted to a Jewish audience. And one of the main purposes of the gospel is to highlight the fact that Jesus is number one, the coming king. He was the promised king in the line of David that all the prophets said would come. Another king like David will come. Another king like David will come and establish his kingdom. Well, we see the word kingdom over and over again preached in this gospel. And Jesus is clearly portrayed as that promised king. Secondly, and this is a little bit more subtle, but he is also portrayed in this gospel as the promised Moses figure that would come. If you remember right back to the book of Deuteronomy before Moses dies, he says, another prophet like me will come. And you better make sure that you listen to him. In fact, even when we finish the Old Testament with Malachi, do you remember? He promised that one day there would come a second exodus. Another exodus type experience would happen. Well, here comes Jesus fulfilling that picture. He is like Moses. And it's not quite as obvious, but there are many allusions and similarities and parallels between Jesus' life and ministry and Moses' life and ministry. And so if you have that in mind, I'm sure you will pick them up. All right. So anyway, the whole gospel of Matthew is directed for Jewish people who understand the Bible. And the, the point of it is to see Jesus is the coming promised king and Jesus is the one just like Moses. Good news all round. All right. Here's three things that I noticed uh, really stood out to me as I read through Matthew's gospel this week. I want to draw your attention to, and hopefully this helps you as you read. The first thing I really noticed was this. Jesus' constant referencing to God as Father. Profound and prolific in this gospel, especially when you consider that God has always been Father to his people. He did, yes, reveal himself to the people in the Old Covenant as Father, or in the Old Testament as Father, but nowhere near the amount of times that Jesus does. In fact, just in his Sermon on the Mount this week, Jesus calls God Father more than the whole of the Hebrew Bible put together. All right, It is a profound emphasis of Jesus' ministry. And we're going to see this revelation all the way through the New Testament, incidentally, but it really stood out to me this 
week on the back of having read the Old Testament for the last 39 weeks, this real major emphasis on God as Father, Heavenly Father, my Father, your Father, the Father, even up to his death when he's praying in the garden, Jesus says, my Father, if it's possible for this cup to pass from me. And it is in this gospel that Jesus says, nobody can know the Father unless I reveal him to you. So Jesus, a major aspect of his ministry is revealing the Father to people. All right, so keep your eye out for the word Father. You're going to see that come again and again. The second thing I really noticed was almost the opposite. Jesus's enemies, okay? Jesus's foes, to stay with the F, Father and then foes, all right? Right from his birth, Jesus is opposed by uh, uh, political leaders and right at his death, he dies. Why? Because of religious opposition. So we see Jesus' life, just this clash of kingdoms or this clash of cultures that Jesus faces his entire life. Herod, it begins with him when Jesus is born at Christmas. Okay, Herod is the Roman installed king of the Jews. He's called king of the Jews. He's not Jewish, but the Romans put him in charge, all right? And he gets intimidated by Jesus being born as the king of the Jews. And so what does he do? He kills all the babies, male babies, two years old and under an exact illusion or parallel to what happened with Moses and Pharaoh, okay? Right back in Exodus, they're drawing the parallel of these two figures, all right, right there. But anyway, the point is, Jesus is opposed by political leaders. He is opposed by Satan immediately after his baptism and all the way through his ministry, he is opposed particularly by a religious group of people, mainly the Pharisees, the scribes of the law and the teachers of the law, who Jesus often and time and time again refers to as a wicked generation, an adulterous generation, a perverse a perverse generation. I want you to pay attention to that word, generation, when he's speaking to them over and over again. Jesus isn't broadly having a go at people. He's very specific on the group of people that he is denouncing who are opposing him. And it's interesting to me as you watch the Pharisees, how their progression of persecution uh, 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 yeah, progresses through the gospel. When they first begin, they're just there in the background murmuring about him. And then they start having a go at his disciples. And then they start confronting him publicly. And then they start trying to trap him in his words. And then they start lying about him and ultimately obviously end up killing him. Well, that is a perverse generation, a specific group of people that oppose Jesus through his life. And that's what I noticed. Jesus preaches God as Father, But his message and his mandate isn't embraced by everyone. Jesus has a group of enemies, a group of foes who are out to get him from the beginning of his life right up to the end. And the third thing I noticed this week, and it's another F word, okay, oops, sorry, another another word starting with F, uh, and it's the word fulfillment, all right? Fulfillment, right from the start of the gospel and all the way through the end. We are going to see Old Testament scriptures and and words coming up again and again that say this was to fulfill what the prophets had said. This was to fulfill what the scripture had said. Now, we have seen this before. If you turn your memory back to when we started Ezra, the opening verse of Ezra, remember when they returned to the promised land to rebuild the temple? Okay, it starts by saying King Cyrus sent God's people back to Jerusalem to fulfill what Jeremiah the prophet had prophesied. So Ezra and Nehemiah, in a sense, was a book about fulfillment. At least it got our hopes up. Whoa, the fulfillment of the promises is going to happen. But that was the only reference to Old Testament scriptures being fulfilled. As the story of Ezra and Nehemiah went on, it was a bit of an anticlimax. No other prophecies were claimed to be being fulfilled. Well, I tell you what, Matthew's gospel is the total opposite of that. Chapter after chapter after chapter, he says this prophecy was fulfilled, that was fulfilled, that was fulfilled, that was fulfilled, that was fulfilled. He's trying to tell his Jewish audience who understand the Old Testament law and the prophets that all these things that were being prophesied are now being fulfilled. It is now being fulfilled in this generation. Right from his birth, in the opening two chapters, I think it's four prophets that are quoted as being fulfilled there. Right to his death, I think it's chapter 26 when he's arrested in the garden and and all that. It said this happened. Three times it says this happened in order to fulfill what was written in the scriptures. In fact, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he begins that sermon himself pretty well by saying, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Everything that you've read in the law, the feast, the tabernacles, the, the, the offerings, the festivals, and the things in the prophets, I have come to fulfill that. Which means, my friends, we have come in the age of the first century, the time of the era of the first century, we have come to the age of fulfillment 
in the whole big picture of God's people. You remember I've said time and time again, there are different ages uh, through the scriptures that I see. It started off in Genesis with the age of the ancients. Adam and Noah and those guys. It then came into the age of the patriarchs, Abram, Isaac and Jacob, the age of the judges, the age of the kings, the age of the divided kingdom, the age of second temple Judaism and the 400 year gap is in there. And finally, the seventh age of the Bible story is the age of fulfillment when Jesus comes to fulfill all that has been written before him. How exciting. Finally, we have reached this moment. So keep your eye out for the word fulfillment. And sometimes uh, uh, these prophecies are fulfilled by direct quotes and other times they are fulfilled by illusion. And you need to pick that up. For example, when we're introduced to John the Baptist, a really good example of this, we're first introduced to John the Baptist as someone who's dressed in camel hair and eating locusts and honey, all right? Well, that is an allusion to how Elijah the prophet used to dress. It should remind you, aha, Elijah dressed like that. What was John's message? Well, he said the axe is already at the root of the tree and about to burn it up. Now that should remind you of what we just read last week in Malachi, where he said a day of the Lord is coming, where from the very roots and branches, the enemies of God's people will be burnt up. All right, here is John the Baptist preaching that and Matthew's gospel is alluding, he's trying to hint to us or suggest to us that therefore John is Elijah. He is the promised Elijah that Malachi promised. And we know this explicitly because chapters later, Jesus says it twice. He deliberately quotes Malachi and says, John is the fulfillment of that scripture. So I say that to say this, there are two ways you can see fulfillment. Sometimes it's alluded to, it's hinted at, it's meant to trigger your memory. And other times it is specifically stated, this was to fulfill that verse. And one of the things that I love to do, if you've got time, okay, to do this when you read this week, when it says this was to fulfill, have a read of that scripture and then go back and read it in its original context to see whether you can draw the similarities. Why is the Holy Spirit saying that that Old Testament scripture is being fulfilled now? All right. Anyway, there, there you go. There are three things that I noticed as I read Matthew's gospel this week. Fulfillment, Jesus's foes, okay, his, as, as persecutors and opposers, but most importantly, Jesus's Father and his great emphasis and ministry to reveal who God the Father is. Ladies and gentlemen, we're up to week number 40 in our Bible reading plan. Enjoy Matthew's gospel this week. And remember, look down at the notes uh, to see how you can read it over seven days or over three. And I hope you enjoy it. Bless your heaps and enjoy Matthew this week. Bye.